Welcome to the Road to Kyoto podcast from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I'm Ian Tennant. The Road to Kyoto is a series of discussions with some of the leading experts who study and track organized crime and related policy challenges. The series was designed to look ahead to the UN Crime Congress, which usually takes place every five years. It was scheduled to take place in April 2020, but has now been postponed to an undetermined date due to the coronavirus outbreak. This week, I'm delighted to be talking with Ambassador Ugi Zvekic, a senior advisor to the Global Initiative, as well as permanent observer to the UN in Vienna for the European Public Law Organization. He's held several other prestigious posts currently and over his career. Ugi, the Crime Congress has a rich history of civil society, academic and expert input. What value do you think that this type of engagement brings to the policymakers and government officials who are at the Congress? Yes, I have had the privilege to participate in a number of the UN Congresses from 1985, which was held in Milan, and then not in all of them till this one that was postponed. And uh, we should be cognizant of the fact that civil society input and even participation in the Congresses was not as massive as it was in the last several of them. It was, you know, Congresses were meant to be more type of um, uh, intergovernmental uh, meeting with participation of academic community, but not so much NGOs or the whole complex of civil society. Now, as, you, as, as we all know, Congresses actually don't have any decision-making powers. What they are for is actually to provide suggestions for policy developments in the area of crime prevention and criminal justice. And from that point of view, Congress, theoretically speaking, is a fantastic forum for civil society to make an input in that because these are policy matters that need to be discussed between governments and civil uh, society. However, I must say that the input of civil society up to now has been rather marginal, even in the Congresses, including the main document of the Congresses, which are usually called declarations by whatever country or city was the host. So in this case, it was meant to be Kyoto Declaration. And the input of uh, civil society on the development of Kyoto Declaration was, in my view, minimal. So actually, civil society was not given an opportunity to participate fully in the preparation of the Congress and, of course, its input on the outcome of the Congress, at least through the political declaration, is very, very meager. That does not mean that during the Congress, the role of the civil society will be marginal. On the contrary, there will be, as you know, a number of side events which are actually handled by civil society. So it will be quite an impressive show of the civil society and and presence at the Congress. So what you're saying is there's lots of opportunity for civil society as well as academia and other experts to input to the kind of informal elements on the margins of the Congress, but the actual policy outcome, which is the political declaration, is purely developed by member states. Correct. Sometimes civil society is used to present a, a sort of a shadow declaration, if you, if you like, of the civil society. But I must say, you know, that somehow Congress, even Congress, is not civil society centered. And that is a pity, because that is the only forum in the present machinery of the UN criminal justice ambit in which civil society and governments can have an open, transparent debate and dialogue. In others, as you know, and we'll probably come to that, that's not the case at all. So what do you think the implications will be for civil society of this forum being postponed? I mean, you say it's kind of unique in the way that civil society and governments can talk to each other. What can civil society do in the meantime to mitigate the loss of this forum? I'm not quite sure that the civil society can do much about that. Because we have to look, you know, at what is the architecture of the Congress and the preparations for the Congress have been already done, but substantive preparations have been carried out and almost finalized with a few 
more small things still to be finalized. So I don't see that civil society now in waiting for the new date of when the Congress will be held can do something to change this situation and to try to be more present or to have more input. Also because civil society in itself as governments is very much restricted in its uh, movement and trying, you know, to come up with something. Maybe, you know, it can be uh, a chance can be probably given by civil society or representatives in different countries to talk with the governments. There is a little bit more time now about certain issues that are at heart of the civil society engagement. But I'm, I don't think that this postponement of the Congress in itself gives an additional opportunity to civil society to do something above what was already done for the preparations of the Congress. Let's go to some of those substantive issues that, you know, that would have been raised at the Congress and hopefully still will be. One of the things, Ugi, that you have highlighted in the past are the links between organized crime and corruption and how the links could be better understood by the international policy community. And what would you hope the Congress will do or respond to in this respect? What would be a key political message on these issues? Well, I think, you know, that the Congress has a, a fantastic opportunity to make policy recommendations and to promote certain strategies. Rather, what I would say, you know, to prompt development of a strategy, which I would like to call global crime governance. This global crime governance means it has to deal with drugs, it has to deal with crime, it has to deal partially also with terrorism and other related things, issues, so sinister issues. And what we actually have now in the UN criminal justice arena, a complete lack of any global strategy of how to respond to the global crime threats. There is no such a thing. What we have are normative bases, such as United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, United Nations Convention Against Corruption. We have three drug conventions. We have several terrorism conventions, but they all sit on their own. There is no Mm. integration among them. And therefore, there is a complete lack of a global crime governance strategy. These, I think, in my view, would be something that the Congress should come up with. It will not, because the preparation of the declaration were not meant to do that. But I think this is an opportunity for for the global civil society to start discussions about putting in place, initiating the process of development of such a global strategy. One of the things that you notice when you are dealing with the the governing bodies, the meetings to do with the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, for example, is that, as you say, everything is has its own setup, has its own framework, and it's difficult to find places to coordinate across those bodies. So I would agree with you when you say that the Congress could be an opportunity to to work across those issues and try and come up with a new strategy. And I think, you know, maybe the the crisis that we are now living in has prompted, at least on the part of global community, has prompted, I think, positive thinking about global strategic approaches and shared instruments to mitigate global challenges and threats such as virus, but not only virus, right? I'm trying to expand it to other global threats, among which is global crime. The organized crime, corruption, terrorism, drug trafficking, etc., etc. So this thinking in the time of crisis that there is a need for global strategy, in my view, is very fruitful as a contribution to the similar type of thinking that I just mentioned before, and that is development of global strategic approach and instruments to face global crime challenges. So what I'm trying to say is that, paradoxically speaking, this very negative situation of virus as a global threat, it's pandemic, right? It's a global threat. 
gives certain input to more global thinking, to more global strategizing. And therefore, maybe the postponement of, let me go back to your first question, the postponement of, of the Kyoto Congress might be productive and positive if this cognitive dimension is fully understood and may be used to promote what uh, we have been discussing up to now. These issues are going to be, you know, the, the global responses to the virus, as you say, the changes in the ways of working that we're experiencing and the delays in all of these big meetings will hopefully prompt some strategic thinking and responses from the international community, including at the Congress. Before we finish, I'd like to go kind of from the global level down to the regional level, if we may. And Ugi, you've been working at the regional level on organized crime issues in the Western Balkans region for some time. And I just wonder what kind of hopes you have for the global responses filtering down to the regional level um, in the Western Balkans and what changes you might hope to see being inspired by the Congress, for example? Well, I think, you know, that the global initiative is one among civil society international organizations that is promoting this uh, approach, you know, from global to local and then from local back to, to global, which is of great importance. Indeed, you know, I think we, we all came to realize over years that talking only about certain principles and mechanisms on the global left level is not good enough if we don't move to the local or regional level or national level, whatever levels are between the global and the most local. I think that policy recommendations coming out from the Congress, or at least some of them, should be applied or could be applied at the regional level and also at the national and local levels. But I think what, um, now talking about the Western Balkans, in which I was involved very much uh, recently, is that when we looked at the crime configuration at the regional level of Western Balkans, it was very clear how much, for example, two things are interlinked, organized crime and corruption. And it was very clear that one cannot provide a separate answer to corruption challenges from the answer to the organized crime challenges. That has to be an integrated answer. So even at that regional level, these thinking and experience about the need for an integrated crime governance response came out very, very forcefully. And I think that this is the way to, to move in the future. And we can therefore start from this uh, local and regional experience and bring it to the global experience. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that maybe local and regional experiences and recognitions of strategic approaches might be even more fruitful for addressing the issue at the global level rather than the other way around. Okay, Ugi, thank you very much. We've covered uh, a lot of different issues we hope will be discussed and we hope action will be taken on at the Congress whenever it does take place. I hope to see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. Please subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Take a moment to leave us a review. They help us get noticed and improve the show. For more on organized crime, head over to our website, www.globalinitiative.net. You can also follow us across social media by searching for The Global Initiative. This show was produced by Jack Megan Vickers with help from Paulina Russell-Barris. I'm Ian Tennant. Thanks for listening.